And on good morning, Nigeria today, we shall review President Tinubu's state visit to the Netherlands. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu embarked on a three-day state visit to the Kingdom of the Netherlands last Tuesday on the 23rd April 2024. The visit was on the invitation of the Prime Minister of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Mark Rutte. That's uh, true, Ademola. During the visit, President Tinubu was engaged in high-level discussions with Prime Minister Mark Rutte of the Netherlands at his official residence in The Hague. President Tunubu noted that Nigeria offers immense opportunities across a pool of sectors and that his administration is deepening reforms to enhance the investment climate. Nigeria is seeking robust, balanced and mutually beneficial partnerships that will bring about value addition in areas like solid minerals. President Tunubu asserted that Nigerians have tremendous confidence in themselves and that his confidence in the Nigerian people gave him the courage to take difficult decisions on their behalf, given his full awareness of the need to give Nigerians the long-term tools they need to succeed. We also know that while in the Netherlands, the president also participated in the Nigerian Dutch Business and Investment Forum, which he inaugurated in The Hague. Netherlands, a platform designed to unite leaders from both nations, conglomerates and organizations with a specific focus on promoting collaboration and partnerships in the fields of agriculture and water management. Now, this has now set a new tone and foundation for stronger economic ties uh, between both countries. Other engagements that took place in the kingdom include extensive discussions with the Dutch officials on port management operations for which they have world-renowned expertise. This highly anticipated trip marks a significant milestone in the bilateral relations between both countries. What are the key takeaways from the visit and what does it mean for Nigeria's economic and political landscape? Welcome to the program. I am Ademola Adouye. I join my colleague Ademola to welcome you to Good Morning Nigeria. We're transmitting live on the network service of the NTA. Uh, we're right here at the headquarters in Abuja. Of course, uh, the usual segments of Good Morning Nigeria will be hitting you really, really nice this morning. Uh, talking about the news for review. And of course, uh, we'll uh, get started with the morning news. Uh, Frama is here. Frama, good morning. Morning, Yere. Good morning, Demola. Good morning, Nigerians. Here's the morning news. Nigeria is set to harness the potential of its youthful population to transform into a global digital economy powerhouse with plans to become a global hub for outsourcing talent. Vice President Kashim Shitima expressed the federal government's confidence at the meeting of African heads of state and government on the 21st replenishment of the International Development Association, IDA 21, in Nairobi, Kenya. Vice President Shetima informed other African leaders of the reforms implemented by the Tinubu administration to curb illicit activities and currency manipulation that had long hindered the nation's progress. Alongside the digital transformation agenda, the Vice President said Nigeria is committed to prioritizing climate resilience and becoming an attractive destination for carbon markets investment. President of Kenya, William Ruto, said the summit was urgent because it was conveyed at a critical juncture facing a convergence of global crises, which included escalating geopolitical tensions that challenge international unity, deepening development and debt crisis that threatens economic stability, an urgent climate emergency that demands immediate and collective action. At the end of the summit, African heads of state and government adopted a joint communique committing countries on the continent to accelerate the continent's economic transformation by strengthening implementation capacities, mobilizing domestic resources, and partnering effectively with IDA. And the two chambers of the National Assembly are set to resume plenary this Tuesday, April 30th. 2024 with a resolve to ensure that ministries, departments and agencies of government implement the renewed hope 
budget, especially with regards to security and economic prosperity. The two chambers had before embarking on the Easter and Ramadan break on March 20th, 20, 2024, amended the 2023 budget and the supplementary budgets to enable implementation of key program projects and policies to improve the lives of Nigerians. Is to do the needful. And so that is why we have to be the nose, the ears, and the eyes of the public. Nigerians will expect that members will center their discussion first on the issue of this tariff of what has happened in the power sector. Now, the Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohamed Idris, has challenged presidential aides to justify their appointments by, among other things, explaining to the people the reasons behind government decisions. This was during an engagement with senior special assistants to the President on community engagement. We are working towards the same purpose. Thank you, sir. The desire of Mr. President is that at the end of the day, Nigeria will recover lost ground, will have the prosperity that all of us so desire. That is the journey that all of us have embarked upon. Meanwhile, the Speaker House of Representatives, Tajuddin Abbas, and former Speaker House of Representatives, Femi Bajabia Mila, who is now the Chief of Staff to President Tinubu, went on a tour of the House of Representatives Chamber, which is being renovated alongside the Senate Chamber, as lawmakers prepare to relocate here for plenary. The renovation commenced in August 2022 to make them functional in line with global trends. Labor unions in Nigeria have been reminded of the provisions of the law that once processes to address sources of grievance have been activated, industrial action should be suspended. This is coming from the president of the National Industrial Court of Nigeria, Justice Benedict Kanyip, at the 2024 pre-May Day lecture convened by the Nigerian Labor Congress. Because where are people are comfortable, they will give us grace and build the morale of the workers to put in board. That behind every policy decision, every labor reform, and every negotiation table, there are real people, workers, families, communities, whose lives are deeply impacted. In talking education now, the Joint Admissions and Matriculation Board, JAM, has withheld the results of more than 64,000 candidates for further investigation in the just-concluded 2024 Unified Tertiary Matriculation Examination, UTME, JAM. JAM Registrar Professor Ishak Oloede announced the results of the UTME results for more than 1.8 million candidates at a press conference in Abuja. And those are the highlights of the news at this time. Good morning, Nigeria continues with Adimola and Yeri after this commercial break. Please don't go away. Thanks for staying with us. You're still on to Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the NTA. Up next is uh, Newspaper Review. Stay with us. Uh, we've got uh, Chukudi Okoli Ugbaja with us this morning. Good morning, Chukudi. Good to have you. Morning. How are you doing? Very well. Welcome. And uh, my brother, how are you doing as well? I'm doing great. You look great. Thank you. Thank you. I see that um, you've worked on the beard a little. <laughs> it's okay. Like you read my mind, like yeah. I told him this morning. Uh, yeah, right. I thought you, you would not notice. <laughs> I did. I already mentioned it. That was the first time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, all anyway, right. Uh, you. Let's
let's, uh, let's take a look at, by the way, uh, men appreciating men on the show this morning. Fantastic. Uh, taking a look at the front pages of... Uh, <laughs> I'm not jealous. I'm just, I'm just stating, so just in case it's the turn of the women tomorrow. Okay. Uh, taking a look at the headlines uh, on the front pages of the papers uh, this morning, uh, we have uh, the New Telegraph uh, to begin with, and the lead story here says, ex secretary Gavna will seek permission from bandits to farm in our lands. The writer says terrorists allocate farming portions to landowners once food security mirage unless insecurity is addressed. Details on page four. We seek permission from bandits to farm on our lands. All right, away from that, we have uh, alleged abuse of office. Emirfele questions court's jurisdiction to try him. That's also unpaid for. Beside that story, we have court threatens to dismiss case against Turku Mamu. That's the terrorist negotiator six transfer from DSS custody to Kujay facility. Uh, we also have this on sports. NFF appoints Vanidi George as head coach of the Super Eagles. And uh, chairing one for workers. Of course, this is for workers in Edo State. Basaki raises minimum wage to 70,000 naira. Names Labour House after Oshomole. All right, you want to find out what's going on? Page 26 would guide you. Uh, above that, uh, above the masthead, actually, we have financial sector's loss to fraud rises by 23% to 17.67 billion naira. Below the picture story, uh, right here on the front page of the New Telegraph, we have federal government must reverse electricity tariff hike. Senate insists, riders, Nigeria needs $10 billion yearly to revive power sector. That's according to the minister. And NERC deregulates meter prices for discos under MAP scheme. Details on pages 2 and 5 of the New Telegraph. And we also have, finally, businesses, commuters suffer as fuel scarcity worsens. All right, that can be found on pages seven and 29. Uh, just before I turn away from the New Telegraph, uh, there's this one on JAM. Uh, uh, it says 2024 UTME JAM withholds probe 64,624 candidates results. Releases 1,842,464. All right, uh, let's look at the leadership quickly now. Uh, the leadership has a different headline, and it's uh, supply glitch worsens fuel scarcity nationwide. Details on page four. Riders, we have not had supplies in two weeks, according to marketers. Petrol queues linger. Motorists, commuters stranded. If crisis persists, we will intervene. That's the Senate. NNPCL keeps mum. Interesting. All of that's on page four of the leadership. In a blue strip, we have this one coming from Yaga, Africa. And it says, Tinibu stands on electoral reforms on Claire. Details on page 21. Beside uh, the lead story on the front page of the leadership, we have EFCC pro Yahaya Bello protesters clash in Abuja. Only 108 senators can decide Ningi's fate, according to the Senate. That can be found on page 8. Gandu J. Probe, Kano Commission, six useful information. And we have Court Stops Multi Choice from Increasing DSTV Go TV Rates. Details on page 20. And finally, this morning, we have this one coming from the Power Minister. Don't pay new tariff without 20 hours electricity. Now, that's to band A customers. What happens to band B, C, D, and E? <laughs> All right. Uh, How do we, Ade, uh, that, but that's impossible. You know why? Because <laughs> it's a prepaid. It's, yeah, it's prepaid. <laughs> so you, can, you ask for a refund. <laughs> so how do we ask? <laughs> anyway, let me, let me. I have the Daily Trust newspaper uh, with me here, and below the nameplate, Uni Abuja female student died in accident. Family. That story can be found on page six. Forex deals, CBN stops for fintechs from onboarding new customers. Details on page 19. NFF appoints Finindi George as Super Ego's head coach. 
uh, details can be found on page 31. And the major uh, headline is uh, Why Petrol Scarcity Persist? Marketers work, resume, work resumption disrupted in Lagos, Ogun. Transporters hike fares. Details on page 4. And federal government to Nigerians accept tariff hike or total blackout. Senate kicks. Details on page 6. Bandit sacked me from my 10,000 hectares farm, Bafarawa. Uh, page 25. Four killed as gunmen attack mourners in Enugu community. Uh, the details can be found on page 24. An ASP syndicate arrested over abduction of five minors. Details on page 5. Let me ask Chooks, yes. how did you get to uh, this place this morning? spite of this uh, fuel scarcity? Two days ago, I bought black market uh, uh, petrol for 1,300 1, per liter. But yesterday, I was lucky a filling station on the Karshi Access was dispensing at 910 per liter. So I, I bought some fuel. I, I pray that will take me till Friday because um, affording it is becoming uh, practically impossible. Uh, and I, I, I pray that prayer. I pray that prayer works. Yeah, you, <laughs> you pray the prayer works. You said um, you pray the fuel takes you. So I'm saying yes. That, uh, that I, 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 ju I just pray because um, <laughs> I mean we will tell you that this job does not fail. You know. Yeah, uh, Enough, yeah. you, know, you see, when the word the logistics was dropped as a problem, <laughs> the, the, the first time we saw this, I said everything gets, you know, pushed under logistics and you're left to wonder what logistics is really all about. Nobody has offered concrete, you know, talk or comment, definitive talk about why this is happening and supply has not even spoken. and uh, that, is, that is the aspect i i, I hate nobody, the most developing economies whether we like it or not have some inevitabilities this is one of them but communication when we meet this the way you handle it helps the people go through it or return consternation for whatever is happening you must tell the people that uh, nobody's looking for anybody's head, sack this or sack that person. But actually, certain things should not be said in these times. Is it that the trucks no longer can ply the road to take the fuel to their destinations? Uh, Dangote Refinery is saying that uh, AGO, which the trucks really run on, they hardly use petrol, mm -hmm. is coming down. So. What is the action that reflects this goodwill coming from the new refinery? Right. You know, I mean, I, we, we just have to sort out a few things about us so that life begins to sound more meaningful. I, do, I can't explain this scarcity. I don't honestly, work in honestly, an NPC. Uh, but um, I should have the privilege of knowing concretely that this is what caused it. Don't leave the people guessing. That is the annoying aspect of it. Not one, not really 100. Uh, uh, um, 130 naira per liter. Uh, is it 100? 1,300 1, naira per liter. I mean, certain things, you have to go through them. But not being told is annoying. It's annoying. We should, we should have left that stage a long time ago as a people. But then that takes me to the good news that um, sabotage of the economy has been, it, it, it is becoming uh, something that... Uh, we are not likely to see any more. Uh, 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 President Ahmed Bola Tinubu is saying that our economy has gone beyond phase of sabotage. And I like that because um, not, a few people will be, not a few people will be happy to, to hear this if you ask me. The impression generally is that prices, inflation and other factors that make life hard in Nigeria are simply things you can't control. But look at how the foreign exchange came down from 1,600 to about 1,300 now. That means that there was sabotage in the system because our importation strength has not suddenly increased. Remember that the strength of your currency is directly relevant to 
what structure you have in terms of a import sending and things, uh, import and export, balance of trade and all that. My economics is not very good. So sabotage was actually the reason. And when the government cracked down on BEDCs at a point, people were talking and all that. They even mentioned how cryptocurrency dealers could also be part of the problem. So these acts of sabotage, we need to locate them, identify them, and, and really tell people, no, you can't take us on this train because it's going to give us a rough ride. You understand? Mm. I really appreciate uh, what was coming out there. I think we're, and make, to, we're making progress, actually. And to make sure that I leave a little annoyance, you know, in the, in the direction of uh, <laughs> Nyerere, let them make sure that nobody's uh, 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 sabotaging anything in agriculture. Because it's food first. After oxygen, water is food. Security is also somewhere there, you know. For instance, the price of fertilizer, I think I priced two days ago. It was um, $35,000, they told me, for a bag. Is that the realistic price? Is that the best price you can get, for instance? Are there middlemen that make it higher and all that? It would amount to sabotage of the economy if something is happening I'm not saying. Of course, you should know that something is happening in the agricultural sector because we have portfolio Are farmers. Are you a farmer? We have portfolio Leave farmers. Like me to talk about farms. <laughs> Nyere, please. I know about portfolio farmers, so maybe that's why. Uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, anyways, you know, talking about farming, there's yes. this worrisome story about, uh, you know, farmers seeking permission mm -hmm. from bandits mm. to go to their farms. No. Nyere, when you begin to talk about one matter on and on and on at a point it becomes so unpalatable That's you don't want to hear it anymore right? now i am not indicting our military i'm not indicting the, the security forces but if you keep telling us 1000 bandits neutralized 100 um, insurgents done and yet people in some of our northern states cannot sleep mm. with what uh, uh, cannot sleep with both eyes closed you begin to ask where are these other people materializing from? Are, those, are they so uncountable that as you neutralize them, more are pouring in? There's a disconnect somewhere. There's a disconnect somewhere. And we, we had better work on it. Because these are human beings like us. In Zamfara, in um, 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 Meduguri, and the yeah. rest of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They it's, need it's... to. This is the time to farm. If they can't farm, you are endangering lives. Yeah. Hunger is not a good prospect. Yeah, it's for not. Okay, just uh, one minute. Uh, NFF appoints Finidi George as Super Eagles head coach. You didn't. You didn't put the <laughs> adjective. <laughs> you know, Ernesto Conco. You know, always prepels. Gangling Finidi George. Oh, okay. Gangling Finidi George. It makes you remember um, uh, Chief Justice. I, 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 I must say, Maker in those days. Um, then um, Korowanta. Yeah. Uh, Okudu, they had a way of playing football. Gangling Finidi George. I didn't actually know he was part of a Perairo. What's the name of the coach? That the, the, no, he, the last one. Pesero, thank no, you. No, I didn't know he was part of the coaching team. No, he's the assistant, actually. Wonderful. Yeah. I like George. I, 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 and I pray that George is going to. Uh, uh, jo uh, there's something we say in the Venetian class J George is a good judge. The good judge is George, you know, to, to contrast between two different uh, vowels. And I like you to Chooks for keeping it, you know, safe and, you know, within time. So okay. I'll just draw it like that. We Thank pray that so George becomes a good judge of football. Football. For us. <laughs> exactly. Okay. All right. Chooks, course, thank so. you. Thank you. We have to go now. Thank you, lady and gentlemen. All right. So we take a break. Good morning, Nigeria continues. Stay with us. Another move by President Bola Tinubu to strengthen Nigeria's bilateral relation with a foreign country. The country is keen to explore every opportunity to enhance its rich natural and human resources towards revamping its economy. A three-day state visit to the Kingdom of the Netherlands from 23rd April 2024 was at the instance of the Prime Minister, Mark Ruth. On his first engagement with the Prime Minister, President Tinubu led bare huge investment opportunities in the country and painstaking reforms his administration has taken to turn around economic fortunes of the country. In another engagement, 
President Bola Tinubu led the nation's delegation to a Nigeria Dutch Business Forum where Nigeria's representatives met with company representatives from the Netherlands. Nigeria is said to have sought robust, balanced and mutual beneficial partnership that will bring about value addition in areas like solid minerals, agriculture, technological knowledge transfer, water management and investment in port authorities. We in Nigeria will have the available land, but our most problem is that the land is shrinking because we have a huge bulging population. There's habitation encroaching on farmlands. So what we need is increasing yield per space. So increasing yield and that's technology. Good seeds, good fertilization, good cultivation and good harvest. And that is, I think, where we can now derive the knowledge and transfer of knowledge from Netherlands to the Nigerian space. So one of the two things that we've identified in our earlier meetings is actually partnership around uh, talent, right, where the Netherlands has a program that is focused on providing scholarship opportunities uh, for young people uh, in specific sectors, especially in the technological space. So we're looking to work together in that space. Uh, he has been giving lots of encouragement to foreign uh, investment investors into the country and uh, it's really uh, yielding a positive result because so many of them are uh, well determined and uh, those that are already in the country like KLM and the rest have assured the president of their commitments. There was an the agreement that we need to have a binational commission and this is something we also discussed with Mr. President and the Prime Minister. So to formalize the relationship even further so that we'll be able to have more uh, production done in Nigeria in terms of the uh, supply and value chains. It was an opportunity for the Nigerian delegation to show to investors in the Netherlands that Nigerians and Nigeria are fertile grounds for progressive investments. A significant move best described by the actors as a milestone in the bilateral relation between the two countries. On Good Morning Nigeria, guests will review President Bola Tinubu's state visit to the Netherlands and the take home. Thank you, Joseph, for the background out there. And uh, in the studio, we already have guests that are going to speak on the review of President Tinubu's uh, state visit to the Netherlands. And also, uh, we have in the studio already seated is a uh, usual guest ambassador Usman Sarki former Nigerian deputy permanent secretary uh, permanent representative to United Nations you are welcome to good morning Nigeria as thank usual you. thank you very much it's a pleasure to be with you thank you thank you sir. very good coming. morning all right we also have joining us uh, right here in the studio Dr. Adoi Matthew O'Malley he's an international affairs analyst uh, Glad to have you on the program. Good morning and thanks for having me. All right. We also have joining us via Zoom, uh, all the way from Lagos, uh, Dr. Adesua Eidiawa, a senior research fellow, International Economic Relations Division of Nigeria, Institute of uh, International Affairs, NIIA. Glad to have you join us, Adesua. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, let, let's kickstart our conversation with uh, Ambassador uh, Usman Sariki now. Uh, let's examine the, the objectives, actually, of the President's visit to the Netherlands. And how do you think this you know, aligns with the administration foreign policy? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And once again, thank you for having me on the program. And good morning, Nigeria. Well, um, it has to be underscored that the visit by Mr. President was at the instance, at the invitation of the Dutch or the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. And that is very significant because they recognized that there is a new uh, game plan now in Nigeria in terms of uh, creating dynamism in the Nigerian economy, in the Nigerian space. And to actually you know, reorganize the country along predictable paths of policy. And that means they have taken cognizance of the policy on subsidy removal, for instance, 
on forex, foreign exchange uh, regime, and also on monetary and fiscal policy, and the tight control being placed by the government on various sectors of the economy in order to create a semblance of discipline and order. And that means countries are now looking for a situation where they can now reap the advantages of these developments in terms of policy. And the Netherlands, as you know, is a very dynamic country in terms of the economy of the country. They are the fifth largest economy in Europe, you know, and also they have a very huge GDP, which is about $1.3 trillion. And their per capita income in the country is tens or elevens in the world, you know, $69,000 per person per head. So these are very significant, impressive statistics. And in the area of agriculture, they are a major producer of food and livestock and milk, dairy and so forth, and processing of agriculture. So all these things dovetail towards the creation of partnership in development to accelerate the uh, development of Nigerian economy. And the Netherlands has been in, the, in, in Nigeria for a long time. So to get back to your question in terms of how this creates uh, an opportunity or dovetails with the Nigerian foreign policy is that, you know, Nigerian foreign policy is predicated on four Ds as the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs enunciated, and one of them is development, one of the four Ds. So, Mr. President, being the premier foreign policy officer of Nigeria, the foreign policy advocate of Nigeria, the number one diplomat of Nigeria, it is his duty to sell the country, as it were, by engaging with foreign countries and to expose to them the opportunities that are available in Nigeria in a very credible, sensible, uh, non-flamboyant uh, way, in, as a statesman should do, to tell them the facts that, look, these are the challenges we are facing in our country, and these are the measures we have taken to overcome or ameliorate those challenges. We want you to join us in order to develop the prospects, the potentials of this country. So foreign policy here is serving the development of the country and entrenching confidence in the country. And I think, you know, you can imagine, you know, from the date Mr. President went to India for the G20 meeting to today, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, investments have flown into the country. And I think that is the uh, forward-looking, proactive foreign policy that we should be expecting to continue, you know, towards the, uh, you know, as the administration continues to grow in office and to uh, develop its strategies for engagement. So we think uh, the foreign policy of Nigeria is now uh, posturing towards creating opportunities to invite investments into the country. And I think that is something very important we should not overlook. Uh, the other thing is actually you know, to create a sense of uh, de-risking the country. There is impression out there that Nigeria is a dangerous place, that it is a very high risk country to come and invest in because of the negative uh, reports. Your earlier program <coughs> indicated you spoke about the uh, you know, insecurity in the country. Yeah. Uh, NTA is highlighting the situation, but you're also presenting another version, another narrative that it's not all that's being said. The reality is that people are coming to Nigeria for business, and Nigerians themselves are cultivating this sense of purpose in what they are doing, despite the challenges here and there that we are experiencing. So President going out there, whether to the World Economic Forum or the G20 Forum or any other engagement bilaterally, is to assure people that Nigeria is not going anywhere. Nigeria is here, we are developing our country, and we are getting on top of the situation. Yeah. Thank you, right. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador uh, Sereke. Uh, Nigeria is on top of the situation, yeah. uh, you know, from what you've said. But I'd like to hear from uh, Dr. Omali. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure you followed uh, the visit of, of the president and, uh, you know, all the takeaways uh, that have been highlighted by those who accompanied him. Uh, what, what is your impression, um, you know, of this uh, visit and what is uh, the likely implication on our economy? Well, uh, good morning, Nigeria. 
I I think it's a, one of the most strategic um, move by the current government because bilateralism is always a very important aspect of international relations. And um, if you look at the itinerary of the president, he was able to hold very high level meetings, especially the Nigerian Dutch Investment Forum, uh, where captains of industries in Nigeria and those of the Netherlands, they have to meet to rob mines on areas that they could come in. Um, you will agree with me that one of the critical problems we have been having is the issue of clearance of goods at our various ports and our, in, our inability to have organized our ports in a very, very good manner that um, foreign ships could bet and uh, clearance of goods and services should be done in record time. Now, um, through this type of visits, this issue of port congestions in Lagos and in many of our ports um, uh, would have been addressed. We will learn from Netherlands. How have they been able to do it? How have they been able to organize um, their port system? So um, if you look at where, what, what the minister was saying, in the areas of also uh, ICT, um, a lot of benefits will come to the country uh, because as, as the Netherlands is one of the most... Uh, industrialized countries uh, in Europe, as the ambassador has stated when he was making his remarks. So um, the Netherlands, uh, we will, we will benefit from the Netherlands in that area of technology transfer, uh, in the areas of uh, promoting uh, technology, as the case may be in our country. So it's a very good move by the president. But above all, on the issue of food security, the Netherlands is the second um, is the second most agriculturally vibrant economy in the world, after the United States of America. Um, they are very; they are one of the highest producers of wheat and um, uh, other products that will be of benefit to the Nigerian economy. Especially now that um, we are trying to diversify from oil economy, uh, moving into this type of strategic bilateral agreements. I heard the minister talking about setting up a binational commission between Nigeria and the Netherlands. That will be very, very instructive. And as we are trying to diversify our economy away from oil, uh, forging this type of partnership, this type of economic alliance with the Netherlands is the way to go. And the Netherlands is also a very influential country within the European Union, uh, just like uh, the ambassador has said. And with um, with this type of invitation because one one thing that is very strategic or very important for us to note as nigerians is that this visit was at the behest of the government of netherlands that means they recognize that a lot is happening in our country which they want to be part of which they want to um, use this opportunity to, to 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 encourage their citizens to come and invest in our economy so i think it's a very good plus for our country is a very good uh, plus for Mr. President and for the foreign policy of the Tunubu administration. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. It's a very good plus for this administration. Okay, let's bring in uh, uh, Dr. Adesua now uh, into this conversation. Uh, Dr. Adesua, I mean, let's look at the issue of strengthening diplomatic um, relations between Nigeria and Netherlands. Do you think this visit will further strengthen the you know, diplomatic relations between the two countries? And what implications do you think uh, this will have for regional and global affairs for the country? Thank you once again for having me. So yes, um, this visit surely will deepen diplomatic, you know, already cordial diplomatic relations between Netherlands and Nigeria will further deepen the relations. And for me as an economist, and not just as an economist, as a Nigerian, the deepening of diplomatic relations has a high potential for leading to stronger economic relations, stronger economic ties. So what the deepening of these relations with um, with Netherlands will do for us, it has great potential for us to improve our economy and um, 
Netherlands is a country that that you want to have strong diplomatic ties and economic ties with for various reasons. It has a very strong economy. I think the ambassador has talked about um, the GDP and the GDP per capita, which is very impressive. Um, more than that, a more wholesome way of looking at how strong that economy is is to look at the economic the economic complexity index of of um, Netherlands. I think for Netherlands is 20, but I think for Nigeria, the economic complexity index is about 119. What that measures is how productive the economy is. Like the, the, it measures the capacity, the capabilities of the economy in the area of production. It's a wholesome measure that shows us how economically viable a country is. And you can see that there's a huge difference between 20 and um, 19. So there's a lot to benefit. Netherlands is also a, a, a country that has a strong um, rule of law, okay, strong governance structure and a strong rule of law. So there's also a lot to benefit from relating more with countries that have shown a, a great capacity to manage the rule of law governance in their country. And there's a lot to learn from there as well. And um, something that is really that really stood out for me with this visit, like everyone has mentioned, is the fact that we were there on the invitation of the prime minister and the king and the queen. And that is um, vital for us. It shows that they recognize the value of deepening ties, of deepening relations with not just Africa, but specifically with Nigeria. And there's a lot, there's a lot of benefit. There's mutual um, economic benefits for both of us, for both countries. So, but, um, and one I would like to pick on, if I can, is the is is the in the agricultural sector, the use or the introduction of technology in our agricultural sector, our, our agricultural productivity, which will help to target food. Which will help to, this will help us target our our food security issues in Nigeria because um Netherlands is renowned for not just their their technology but for their agricultural um, advancement using technological introductions to advance um agri for example in the in um in the area of um cattle rearing there's a lot that we can benefit um as the minister had mentioned there's a lot that we can benefit from that potential relationship that we are hoping would you know, would materialize sooner than later in rearing uh, cattle in producing milk because currently um, the milk production of Nigerian cattle, you know, while it is it's it's while the, the, the species of cattle in Nigeria are about 90% of the species are not as are in such a way that their production, their genetic production of milk is not sustainable for it to feed way to, to be preserved for longer, in which case it can now, um, you know, cater to the entire populace. So there's an opportunity for us there to introduce technology in our cattle rearing sector, in our, in our agricultural sector, specifically cattle rearing, of course, in other areas as well, you know. So for me, it's very exciting to see that um, the Netherlands see that there's a lot to benefit from us. And obviously, we have... Um, a lot to benefit from relations with Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Ejiawa, of course, so much has been said about the agricultural sector and what we can borrow from Netherlands, uh, but we must also mention, uh, you know, the extensive logistics uh, network that the Netherlands has. You know, they do not just—they're not just the second largest exporter of of uh, agricultural produce after the U.S. Uh, it's also on record that uh, uh, vegetables harvested in Netherlands say today are bought in New York the same day. So they have a way of doing this export thing. So besides the agricultural part, of course, finding a way to also export so it can be a major revenue earner for us will be a way to go. But looking away from agriculture, let's look at power now. Uh, power is also another area where I think Nigeria can tap from. I'd like to hear your view about that because we know that uh, uh, about 50 million solar plants has been installed in the Netherlands uh, so far. Uh, and in Nigeria, we're still grappling with the national grid and all of that. Could you speak to that? Well, um, 
technology is at the heart of the progress in the power sector in uh, the Netherlands, as it is in Europe. They have strategically calculated that their over-dependence on uh, fossil fuel, for instance. Netherlands is a major gas producing country since the 1950s. But they realize that they need to diversify and move away from fossil fuel to actually generating energy from other sources, particularly clean renewable sources. So they first concentrated on wind energy. You know, the Netherlands is called the low countries. There is a flat land, and it's not a big country, relatively small, 40 something thousand square kilometers, just the size of Kano, or even less than Kano stage. So it is very important for us to realize that technology is what drives the economy, what drives the power sector, even the agricultural sector in Netherlands. So we have to now look at how we are going to harness and adapt technology to our power sector in this country. And it's also important for us to realize that their research institutions and their universities are the ones driving these processes in terms of generating economy, in terms of advancing their power sector to the cutting edge. So for us to benefit from that, we have to sit down with them really to structure our conversation around objectives. Today, we are producing maybe less than 5,000 uh, megawatts of power. And even that, we cannot now uh, offtake it efficiently because of transmission and distribution problems. So where will be the uh, areas that the Dutch or the Netherlands companies will come in in order to assist us? The federal government has to make up its mind about really, truly diversifying the power sector and also creating opportunities for other parties to come in. Today at the generating area, we have the generating companies. We have given out the concessions to these companies. How efficient, how effective are these companies in terms of generating power? And then the transmission is now still controlled by the federal government. How wise and how efficient is that policy? Are there some strategic considerations behind it to control the transmission in terms of uh, the ownership of the transmission company or facilities by the federal government? Would it be possible to also diversify and privatize the transmission uh, sector? What harm will it do to the Nigerian economy if that is done? So these are the questions that we need to ask. Then the distribution itself to off-takers, to industries, to hospitals, to schools, to, to households. What plans do we have? Now, you have spoken about renewable energy. If you go the, down the route of renewable energy, how are you going to feed what you have generated into the national grid? Who will be the owner of the transmission uh, of this power that you have generated? At what price per unit are you going to now give it to the generating, I mean to the distribution uh, companies? And the final uptaker, whether it's a household or hospital or school or, or industry, how much are they going to pay? Will there be a discrepancy between the power produced by the solar or wind farms and then by those that are currently producing in the country. So these are complexities that need to be sorted out by our power institutions in the country. That said, what we need is actually to create discipline in governance, in administration, in terms of controls, in terms of supervision, in terms of compliance, these are the critical areas where we need the government to sit up to look at these uh, regulatory bodies. Are they doing their work? Are they allowed to do their work? Do they have the requisite knowledge and powers to do their work? Without the efficient and effective involvement of the regulatory agencies, no matter what sort of investment comes into the country, there will be lapses and deficiencies that will defeat the purpose of these investments. So my advice is for the government to really sit down, take a tabletop look at the power sector, dissect it into smaller pieces in terms of the various competencies 
and roles of the regulatory bodies and then see where unification can take place in order to harmonize mandates and responsibilities and also to set targets for each of these units in order to gauge their performance. Without that, I don't think we are going to solve the power and energy uh, challenge in the country. The other issue is the availability of natural gas. We are sitting on top of trillions of square uh, feet you know, of uh, gas in this country. But always we are told that there is shortage of gas to be supplied to the power stations. Now you ask yourselves, who owns the gas? Is it the Nigerian government or the partners who produce the gas? Under what sort of legal arrangements is gas given to these companies that we cannot even have enough gas to give to uh, our petrochemical companies, our power companies like those in Eggbin or Motoshoy and others? Mm -hmm. What is the problem? So we have to really sit down to do some serious thinking. And also we have to hold the generating companies accountable. For the last eight or 12 years now, I think when these uh, concessions have been given to them, what is the rate of their performance? What is the quality of service that they are producing? What is the investments that have, they have injected into these uh, various generating uh, facilities that they have taken over? So we have to ask questions because at the end, of it all, we are the consumers. We are the ones who are affected. Now in my state, in Borno State for instance, I understand that about 14 or 15 local governments are not connected to the national grid. So the state government is spending a lot of money in order to really supply power to these areas. Without electricity, how can you speak of development? It's not possible. So we have to really look at the map of the country to see where the advantage of power sourcing lies. Where can we reap the benefits of wind power, solar power, thermal power, hydropower, gas, and so forth, and then aggregate them together in a way that will now be attractive to investors, whether from uh, Netherlands or anywhere. And also, let us involve Nigerians. There are Nigerian companies that are interested in the power sector, but have they been invited constructively to sit down with the government and other partners to discuss the power sector? I think we need to have a really a summit on power in Nigeria, if we are serious, to discuss all the complexities, all the challenges of the power sector. And then, based on the aggregate outcomes of this summit discussion, then we can decide where to go. That, I think, is a very strategic move that has to be done now. We cannot delay it any further. I guess they are already at it already because, you know, yesterday the uh, National Assembly, they called the power minister, you know, to question concerning the power sector. But besides the power sector, mm. you, you, earlier on you mentioned the issue of security, terrorism yeah. and all that. Mm. How can we leverage on this relationship with Netherlands, you know, mm. to improve this, uh, the area of security and yeah. terrorism and bring, you know, mm. kind of sanity, you know, yes. to the country? Well, uh, as I said, Netherlands is a, re a relatively small country, just the size of Kano State or any or um, uh, about half, just more than half the size of Borno State. So it is very easy for them relatively to control their space in terms of uh, providing security. But the larger picture is the regional arrangement in the EU, whereby security is a collective affair. And if you look at the Euro European Union today, none of the country poses a risk in terms of security to other uh, states in the, in the region. So they have developed a, a mechanism of collective security, sharing of intelligence, uh, generic sort of training of their forces, and more importantly, a sort of uh, dynamic policy in terms of sharing of information and harmonization of policy in the area of security. Here in Nigeria, with a country that is almost 927,000 square kilometers with very broad 
you know, borders, long borders, and also we are ne uh, neighboring countries of about four or five or uh, six countries, never, you know. It's not easy to secure the entirety of the country. So here you need, at this modern age, technology in terms of s surveillance, monitoring, supervision, and also logistics in terms of quick response by your security forces to go to any spot that is identified as a trouble spot. So intelligence and logistics are very critical. And with the Netherlands, when we sit down to discuss, for instance, the Office of the National Security Advisor, uh, the Office of the Inspector General of Police, and our Defense Forces, they can now discuss in terms of maritime security. They are very good at that. Because today, one of the greatest challenges is that we have maritime insecurity in terms of oil theft, in terms of piracy, and general uh, disturbances that are happening in our coastal areas. So even if we just take, pick this item of maritime security with the Netherlands, it will go a long way in helping our country to stabilize the economy, to stabilize our image in terms of uh, a peaceful and secure country. Then the other uh, aspect is air security. Our aviation sector poses a lot of challenges to operators in this country. We can learn a lot from the Netherlands in terms of controlling of the airspace, in terms of upgrading our air, uh, airport facilities, airspace management, and so forth. Remember, the security of transportation, logistics, as Madame uh, pointed out, are key to the development of any country. So if you now enhance the security in these sectors, you are creating a psychological uh, situation whereby other partners will now think that you are safe, stable, and they will feel comfortable in dealing with you in terms of whether it's business or tourism. But today, if you now go and ask anybody to come to Nigeria as a tourist, some bells will be ringing in their minds, you know, some danger signals. But if we are able to clear this perception of image of insecurity in Nigeria, I think it will be very easy to sell the country to investors, to uh, potential tourist visitors, and all those sorts of things. So these are the areas that I would recommend that the aftermath of the visit, the, especially with the establishment of the binational commission, the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs pointed out to, we should identify the area of power, agriculture, and security to discuss with the, uh, with the, with the Netherlands. All right, thank you so much, Ambassador Sereke. Uh, uh, Dr. Omale, uh, you listened uh, to Ambassador you know, speak extensively about the, the gains or what we could learn and you know, benefit from the Netherlands. But you know, some Nigerians uh, you know, do not uh, really fancy such visits. They do not uh, think that anything tangible will come out from such uh, a visit and expected investors from other countries to come develop Nigeria. They think uh, that um, you know, uh, the posture of government has a way of uh, interfering with such visits and how international community relates with Nigeria. Uh, for example, uh, does this viral vid video of the Prime Minister of uh, the Netherlands walking to his office at The Hague? And people think that uh, if we cut the cost of governance, it would send a clearer signal to the international community that we are ready to develop the nation, one, and to also free resources uh, to be able to attend to some infrastructure of priorities. Do you agree with this thought, you know, as regards that Nigeria itself must first, you know, be able to do certain things, checks and balances, uh, before looking out for investors? Yeah, I... I agree with you entirely that we need to also um, look at ourselves, our culture, our ways of doing things, and then we have to also um, organize our system in such a way that we can also encourage uh, people to come and invest in our economy. So we have a lot of work to do in that regard. For example, in terms of energy consumption, you know, somebody will have six cars, seven cars, packed, you know, and, and so on. So um, uh, in Netherlands, p people are encouraged to ride bicycles. So in the morning, you see everybody, they take their bicycle, they go. So all this, one, it helps the environment in terms of pollution. 
Two, it's also physically it's good, it's an exercise for the body. And three, it also gives the, um, you, you, it also um, allows space, like Ambassador said, it's a small country. So um, citizens are encouraged to imbibe the culture of riding bicycle. But here in Nigeria, if anybody sees you riding bicycle, of course, you know, they will just uh, make fun of you or, or make jest of you that you are riding bicycle. Mm. But there is part of their culture. Here, we do a lot of wastages, uh, even in terms of uh, energy consumption, in terms of our cultural attitudes, uh, needless ceremonies, burial, so many things. So we, we have a lot, not just cutting costs of governance, we also have to cut cost of our living. Because we most times we we spend a lot of resources on things that are not um, relevant. On the issue of the visit, um, because of experience in the past, I remember when we got into democracy, Obasanjo just shuttled around the world. Uh, successive governments they keep on traveling all over, and Nigerians will be asking, what are the benefits of all these? junketing. In fact, I read on some papers, they call it junketing, uh, traveling up and down to me. But you see, we cannot isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. The world is a global village, and we have to also engage with the outside world. Um, um, yes, a lot of critics will say, oh, the visits are not necessary. But those of us that operate within the international system know that these visits have a lot of positive uh, a lot of uh, gains for our economy uh, because you cannot look at the way our dollar is falling is because we have not been able to attract the type of investments that we too can repatriate uh, profit to our country look at south africa is benefiting a lot look at shoprite look look at mtn look at all their companies here where are our companies where are our companies that are competing globally where are our companies that are leveraging, that are using opportunity? Because there's nothing stop a company in Nigeria from going to the Netherlands, invest in the Netherlands, and bring the profits to us. There's nothing stopping any of us. We are complaining that we don't have jobs. But there are opportunities out there all over the globe. And I think that is what um, the president and the foreign policy experts of this government are thinking. It's a two-way traffic. When we talk about bilateral relations, it's a two-way traffic. Your country benefits and the other country, the two partners, will have it's a mutual beneficial relationship. Now, um, on the issue of power, which Ambassador was talking about, I, I needed to make that point. Um, yes, we have power problem. But you see, the problem I have with this issue of power is, why must we have a national grid? Why must all the power generated be transferred to Oshobo? Then Oshobo will start distributing. I mean, it's, can't we have off-grid systems? For example, um, there's a lot of sunshine in the northern part of the country. There's the wind. There are other. So everybody must not be on the national grid. That is where I disagree. Um, states can generate their own power, just like it was done in Plateau uh, with Netco where they can have their own area, generate the power, like you're saying, about 12 local governments in Bruno states uh, are not on the national grid. Fine. Those, the governor can implement solar schemes for those local governments. Everybody must not be. The problem we have in the country is that everything is centralized nationally. We should be able to devolve. I, I was happy recently that uh, states are now allowed to generate electricity in the past it was not so it's a very good omen now states can create their own electricity companies states can uh, generate their own power i hear that in nabia state now there's almost 24 hours power supply thanks to the geometric uh, company that entered into partnership with the state government and they are doing well if that is replicated we could solve this issue of power and we need this type of partnership to be able to do this. There are Nigerians in the power sector, but if you look critically at the power sector uh, privatization, a lot of us are agitating that uh, the government should revisit the privatization because of the way 
and manner. These things were, well, I'm, I'm sorry to say, these things were not done as transparent as we would have wished, that Nigerians would have wished. Um, we know that some of these jenkos and uh, were sold to uh, companies that, to my mind, might not be as competent as we expect them to have been. Because if they are after eight years down the line, we should have known, we should have seen the companies would have uh, transformed the power sector. Because after, there is even worse than when power holding company was there. So we should have seen an improvement. Yes, we would have sector. seen an improvement. But we are still struggling with 4,000, 5,000 megawatts. We are still struggling to... essentially with... With about 100 million Nigerians <laughs> still <laughs> lacking <laughs> access yes. to electricity. Uh, you okay, know, okay. but you know, I, you know, there's there's a point you made that this uh, this uh, visits are important and, and all of that. Maybe Ambassador would uh, you know help me uh, clear the, this point about you know the cost of governance, the posture of government. Uh, for example, uh, what you talked about the fact that oh well, uh, when you, they go for such visits, they're able to clear the air that oh you can come to Nigeria to invest is safe and all of that. But looking at say for example the security details of our government officials, uh, you know, I gave an example of the Prime Minister of uh, the Netherlands. What Working without escorts, without security details, nothing. And then the posture of our own government officials sends a different signal. How does this lead to a different interpretation for the investors coming into the country? It's, it's, it's true that there should be concern about the cost of government, governance or government in this country. And that centers largely in the maintenance of officials, really, and the bureaucracy of the government. So here we need to, like Dr. O'Malley pointed out, this culture of uh, entitlement, this sense of privilege, must be removed from holding of office. If you hold office in Nigeria, whether it's elective office or appointed one, you are at the behest of certain institutional frameworks, certain mandates that you have to discharge. It's not a privilege or an entitlement. You are only there to serve the country and the people. For that reason, you have to now assume a profile that is as low as possible in terms of what, you, what will be expended on you. But here, unfortunately, the moment an official or a politician is elected into office or an official is appointed into high office, the paraphernalia of office quadruples in some cases, whereby the multiple entitlements aggregated to that person will even outweigh, you know, what his counterpart in another country, actually even in developed countries, will enjoy. So there should be a discussion in Nigeria, by Nigerians, on the cost of government. And for them to agree and insist that per person, per official, there shouldn't be more than 10 or 15 percent of the entire expenditure of a certain level that will be going to that to service that particular office. So if you are a minister, for instance, why do you need three or four or five SUVs, you know, some of them bulletproof? Why do you need a convoy of Helux? buses, I mean Helux uh, pickups following you everywhere with about seven or eight details. So these are things that we need to really re-examine in terms of the privileges and entitlements of officials. It wasn't the case, you know, uh, always like that, you know, in, in the country. Uh, in past administration that we have witnessed, governors and ministers move virtually in incognito. It was very small uh, escorts. A governor was entitled to just one police ADC who was following him around. But today you find civil defense, police, DSS and others following one person. All of them carrying pistols and rifles. It conveys a sense of general insecurity when that is done. It's not necessary. But if you are going to a danger zone, for instance, it will not be advisable to expose your minister or governor to, to danger. They have to be protected, I agree. But it shouldn't be a daily uh, affair. Now, the cost of government will entail looking at the legislature. 
would entail looking at the ex uh, the the executive and also the ju uh, the judiciary, the three arms of the government. And let us not forget, even at the state level, there is this issue of the implication of cost of government. So there must be a debate in the country, a reasoned, rational debate on checking and reducing the cost of government. You are correct, madam, in saying that foreign partners, when they look at this extravagance going on in the country, they will be concerned that we are not a disciplined people. And like uh, Dr. O'Malley said, we need to organize ourselves, create a sense of discipline, a, a sense of purpose in administration, in governance, for others to take us more seriously. Uh, the recent, uh, recent um, measures taken by the government in creating or harmonizing or collapsing institutions together based on the oral or, or or senior report, exactly, reports. is a very good move. So, but we need to really look at these things as work in progress and take it systematically in order to achieve the goal by maybe 2025. We should have harmonized administration and along the line to also cut the cost of governance. Okay, thank you very much, Ambassador. Mm -hmm. Now let's go back to our Zoom guest, uh, Dr. Desua. Uh, earlier on, you talked about the uh, economic benefits of this visit, especially in the area of agriculture. And, uh, you know, for Nigeria being able to take advantage, to leverage on the technology uh, that uh, abounds in that country to improve our agricultural yields in this country. But I also want to ask, how do you think that this visit will help uh, ordinary Nigerians actually to benefit, uh, particularly in terms of uh, job creation, uh, economic growth, and improved living standards? Thank you so much. That's a very vital question um, because um, there are the issues of when these visits are ongoing, people ask, how does that translate to money in pockets? How does that translate to more children enrolled in school? How does that translate to macroeconomic indicators improving? And that's a very vital question to answer. And before I go on, I need to say that um, there's a time lag to investment. So assuming the investments are ready to be pumped into the economy right now. That time lag does exist. Um, but despite that, um, how does this translate? For example, in the in the in the area of waste management, which is one area that uh, the Netherlands government further promised a hundred million dollar ingestion into um, waste to wealth facility in Lagos. That would go a huge, um, a huge way in impacting the ordinary man in the streets of Lagos. So as we all know, we're dealing with, um, even though the LOMA, the Lagos State Risk Management Agency, they are relentless in their efforts to sanitize the state. And we see that happening. However, it's not sufficient because the production capacity of, waste production capacity of Lagos State is increasing at a higher rate than they're able to address it. So with this $100 million investment into waste wealth, the waste wealth facility in Lagos, that would translate almost immediately as soon as the investment is made into cleaner, cleaner markets, you know, into cleaner streets in Lagos. And of course, that facility will employ people. People will be employed and again, the, the whole recycling process for the waste to wealth facility will also yield economic gains. More, more so than that, once that facility is also um, instituted in Lagos, there's the opportunity for, uh, for Nigeria to, to, speaking of extending services to neighboring West African countries, there's also the talk about the water management system. And so the water management system is also very important for the common man because we have, um, for example, last year, I think, or last year about three to 500, 2022, and last year about 300 to 200 people died from flooding. And um, 
so far, I think we have um, 1.4 million in recent times, about 1.4 million people displaced, 3 million people affected by flooding issues in Nigeria. So that waste management, that waste management um, introduction, that waste management relation, economic relation with Netherlands will go a long way to affect the common man, to provide relief for people in, in the, the, flood, the flood management will go a long way to provide relief for people in flooded in flood prone areas. The Netherlands has advanced technology. They, they have a low lying geographical landscape. So they have advanced technology in controlling flood. So the flood management will go a long way in controlling flood in flood prone areas, which will also translate to making crops available because the flooding affects the crop, the, the, the availability of crops, which also leads to food insecurity. So you can see that the, these investments will easily trickle down to the common man. For example, like I said, in waste management, in uh, in um, what in water management, which is flood control, and also in supplying um, portable drinking water to to Nigerians. It would make water available to more Nigerians. About 70 million Nigerians right now do not have access to good portable um, water. 70 million, and so. A, a collaboration, a partnership in water management, in providing, supplying portable drinking water, in learning the technology for waste management and learning the technology for flood control will also translate to benefits for the common man. It will also provide economic um, opportunities for Nigeria because we can extend and expand the services to neighboring countries. For example, our neighbors, Niger, who are having um, a water crisis. We can extend the services to neighboring countries. So there are a myriad of ways that um, this relationship. Uh, am I there, please? Okay. So there are a myriad of ways that this relationship can uh, translate to the common man. Still on agriculture, when the value chain of uh, when technology is introduced into the uh, agricultural processes, it improves the value chain. Not only do, are we able to feed the nation, we are also able to um, diversify our exports by by um, exporting our agricultural products. I know that the Netherlands has said that they will be the first um, uh, off-takers of the projected and increased productivity of the livestock, the milk from the mm -hmm. livestock. But however, that also creates an opportunity for us to to improve our technology our capacity in processing livestock products and all the agricultural products to export to neighboring West African countries or even African countries. For example, we have the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement there. And a lot of questions are out there. Okay, what are we going to export? What are we going to sell? The first thing is to diversify our economy. And this relationship is an important um, avenue for us to work towards that. Assuming, of course, that we handle all our internal and our domestic um, issues, our macroeconomic issues, because when investors are coming into the country, they want to see the, the what are the macroeconomic indicators. How are domestic uh, investors, how are they faring? So while we are out there um, looking for foreign investments, what is the situation with our domestic investments? And I think that's another conversation altogether. Dr. Adesua, of course, uh, you know, domestic investments, what are we doing with them? Uh, that's a great question. All right, welcome back. It's still Good Morning Nigeria, live on the network service of the NTA, uh, still reviewing uh, the visit of the president to the Netherlands. So our guests are still very much with us, and I'd like to get to Ambassador uh, Sarah now. And of course, I'd like you to respond to the last note uh, where Dr. Adesua, uh, you know, left off, you know, before we went on the break, talking about uh, domestic investors. Uh, you know, the question will be that uh, why do we have to look out for foreign, uh, uh, you know, experts, so if you like investors, you know, to do certain things in this country when we can, you know, leverage on Nigerian investors that we have at the moment and also exploit our diaspora community. That's on one hand. Then secondly, how do you think that this visit to the Netherlands would affect Nigeria's bid uh, for a permanent seat on the United Nations uh, Security Council. 
any kind of support you think the Netherlands will give Nigeria? Yes, indeed. Uh, let me start by actually responding to the second aspect of your question, which is of great interest to me. Cultivating the goodwill and friendship of countries like Netherlands gives you an added advantage, an edge, as it were, in actually you know, going into the Security Council as the preferred candidate for a permanent position in Africa. The Netherlands, as I said, is a very key member of the European Union. And already there is the EU-Africa partnership in terms of harmonizing policy uh, at the multilateral level and also bilaterally with African countries. So Nigeria leveraging the friendship and goodwill of Netherlands will contribute to the effective recognition of our bid, of our candidature to the Security Council. And I think it's very good to, as I said earlier, the visit by Mr. President is to show statesmanship to show maturity that we have arrived and we are on top of situations. And this idea conveys confidence in our country as a very responsible member state of the international community, whereby when we go into the Security Council as a permanent member, the world can rely on us to make rational choices and to contribute effectively to the maintenance of international peace and security, to contribute to international sustainable development, to contribute to democratization of the world, and respecting of human rights and promotion of human rights. These are the essential purposes of the United Nations. So advancing the UN Charter is done by member states. And countries like Nigeria, with increasing capacity, regionally and globally, will be very important in coming on board into the Security Council. So with this visit, there is no reason why the Netherlands should not actually respond favorably to any claim by Nigeria, <coughs> excuse me, to be recognized as a candidate, a viable, effective, logical candidate into the Security Council. So this is an added, it's a step forward. And with the Netherlands, other countries like Spain, Germany, and others will come on board to recognize Nigeria's claim. As to the first remark in terms of uh, the potentials of doing business in Nigeria and investment and why can't we cultivate our own domestic and diaspora, it's very important for us to realize, as uh, Dr. Adeshua said, that Investments generate, they create momentum in the economy. It doesn't matter where they come from, whether they are domestic or diaspora or actually foreign investment. But the key is, what do you do with the investments? Where will the investment be directed? Do you have the capacity to absorb the investments? What are your policies to attract investments? When we deal with the Netherlands, for instance, have we thought about the capacity of our banking sector? They have very strong, well-recognized, globally recognized banking, banking institutions in the Netherlands. Are our banks up to the task in terms of supporting and creating opportunities for financial flows into the country? Is there transparency? Is there competence? Is there security in our banking system? So these are the questions that we have to ask when dealing with countries like Netherlands. And they are going to ask the same question. They will do forensic examination and studies of our banks. Without the banks, there can be no investments because you have to move capital from one part of the world to the other. And you have to account for it. With this idea of money laundering and other things or other concerns about failing of terrorism and so forth, Countries that move money from one point to the other are very concerned about the safety, the security, and the end in a, a target or the end results of the money they are moving. So it's very important for us to show capacity, to show seriousness and discipline and organization in dealing with foreign countries for them to be comfortable with us. Uh, the Nigerian diaspora, they are also concerned about their money, their investment. When their money comes into Nigeria, they expect, number one, for that money to be secure, and where they invest it to generate returns for them. So the federal government and the state governments must now institute policies and programs that will secure the investment space in the country. 
And it's very important, as I said earlier, for regulatory agencies to be up to scratch in terms of conveying a sense of purpose and seriousness to the world. So the organization of the government and institutions are very critical. Okay. Now the other aspect, finally, I think what Dr. Adeshua raised about agriculture is very important. Only 2% of the Netherlands population is engaged in agriculture. And but they are today the world's number one producer after America. And the export to the whole world, just 2% of that country. Why? Because of science and technology. Their research institutions churn out ideas. And their government and companies practicalize those ideas. So mechanization, uh, injection of science and technology into agriculture has reduced even the role of human beings in production. So when we look at the Netherlands today, we should now actually seek for competencies whereby our research institutions can be upgraded. Some of them are still working with facilities of the 1960s and 70s. Mm. How go to VOM, the uh, animal veterinary research institute today? It's a shadow of its former self. Go to Napri in, in Shika or, in, or Samo Rosaria. It's a shadow of its former self. Go to all the research institutions in the country today. NTA, I think, should do a survey of the research institutions, of the science and technology institutions, for you to, to really tell Nigerians what is the state of the, their capacities and capabilities today. Do they have the required resources to really do research and transform the economy, whether in agriculture or industry or anywhere? They don't. They need capital, they need modern equipment, they need training, they need laboratories, they need facilities and everything. Talk to them, go to them, and see what they have. So the Netherlands, when they come in, they are not going to now just bring money and go back. They want to engage with institutions. And where are those institutions? What are they? What are their capacities? So if uh, very recently, the Borno State Governor, His Excellency Professor Babagan Amara met with Mr. President to highlight the importance of the South Chad Irrigation Scheme, for instance, to the President. The South Chad Irrigation Scheme has over 200,000 hectares of land where you can produce virtually everything there. But the problem is access to water. So the recharging of Lake Chad should be one of the priorities when we discuss with the Netherlands and the European Union to support the federal government's objective of recharging Lake Chad from internal waterways in order to make the South Chad irrigation scheme viable. And the control of floods in central Nigeria and southeastern Nigeria is very critical because when floods come, they are now because of climate change happening every year. If you don't control them, economic productivity, farming and everything will be adversely affected. So when we speak with the Netherlands, we take a look at the country. Where are we going to established projects? Where are we going to prioritize programs and so forth? So to my mind, the South Chad project, the flood control in central and uh, southeastern Nigeria are very critical. And we should look at that as part of the physical objectives that we can undertake. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you, Thank you for your thoughts there. We must actually show competence and you know seriousness in all that we do. Let's bring in Dr. Amali now. I, I, I want you to, well, we're still looking at the visit and the influence and the, the, the benefits, uh, especially Nigeria's stands on uh, global issues like climate change, human rights and migration. What common ground can we expect, you know, with Netherlands with this visit? Yeah, um, Nigeria and, and Netherlands, we share similar, we, we, we've come a long way in our bilateral relationship. Um, we can learn a lot from their democracy. Uh, Netherlands is a democratic country. We, we can learn from the way they do their things, the way they, they organize their country. Um, I always tell people that um, most times if we look at developed societies, we want to uh, be like them. But we, most of the positive things they do, we, instead of us copying it, we don't copy them. Or when we copy, 
we do we copy wrongly, we copy wrongly or we, <laughs> we we copy it upside down. Uh, but on a serious note, uh, we have a lot to learn from how their democracy, how their system is operating. And um, if nothing else, that will, will help build our economy. Uh, then secondly, um, we, like we said earlier, the issue of technology transfer. Uh, we have a lot to learn from Netherlands in the area of uh, technology transfer, especially like we also in the area of agriculture in the area of um, uh, services, banking, um, in the areas of uh, banking, in the areas of, and other, several other sectors who have a lot to uh, learn from, from the Netherlands. Look at the aviation sector, for example. KLM is one of the biggest airlines in the world. And up to now, we don't have um, an air, uh, air Nigeria or, 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 or something like that. So we can also uh, leverage, partner with KLM to see how we can jumpstart our Nigerian air or also uh, refurbish our airports to international standards. So we have a lot uh, to learn. Uh, Nigeria has a lot to benefit from this relationship. In, like I said, in the area of democracy, in the area of uh, agricultural output, in the area of um, um, services, uh, we have a lot to benefit as a country. And also the Netherlands too. Um, we also need Nigeria as a very strategic partner. Nigeria is the largest country in Africa uh, in terms of population. Uh, and Nigeria also is, is a, a regional power within Africa. So the Netherlands will benefit tremendously from a strategic partner with a country like Nigeria. The Netherlands will be able to have a very important inroad into uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that is very instructive. I think they realize the importance of Nigeria, and that is why they are engaging with, with, with Nigeria. Also, um, exchange programs uh, between uh, scholarships to students, as the Minister of uh, 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 Communication said, uh, exchange program has been ongoing between the two countries. They've been giving a lot of scholarship to uh, uh, Nigerians to study in the Netherlands and I think that will continue. This visit with further strengthen such um, um, uh, exchange between Nigeria and, and the Netherlands. You know, what I, what I, I want to, I want to, you know, you know Nigeria stands on the issue of climate change, migration and all that and what Nigeria is pushing for. With this visit, do you think uh, Netherlands will support, you know, Nigeria's stand on climate change, for instance, you know. Yeah, yes. Um, I think uh, we are all agreed about issues of climate change. The, the most important thing now is how do we mitigate the effects of climate change? How do we cut down uh, gas emissions? How do we cut down? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Nigeria and, um, and, and Netherlands will look at the importance of adhering to most of the issues that will address or mitigate the impact of climate change. So I think this type of visit will help a lot, especially in terms of cutting down uh, 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 carbon emissions. Uh, the, the, the Netherlands will play a role in supporting us uh, because they also have the technology, they have the expertise, they have the experience. Uh, like we talked earlier, we talked about them moving to renewable energy. Okay. Uh, they, we, we, we have a lot to learn in that aspect. So definitely um, um, Nigeria and uh, Netherlands are on the same page on the issue of uh, climate change and Nigeria will benefit a lot from the expertise of Netherlands, how they have been able to organize their society in such a way that the, the energy transition from, uh, to renewable energy will benefit a lot from that partnership in terms of climate, climate change issues. And even in the international front, uh, Nigeria has also been one of the vocal. We participated in the recent uh, uh, conference, climate change conference uh, uh, in Dubai. And I think uh, most of the issues that were raised, uh, they are in tandem with uh, 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 the, 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 the Netherlands 
and Nigeria, I think we are on the same page. We, are, we don't have any cause whatsoever to have any sharp disagreement on the issue of climate change. All right. Thank you, Dr. Omale. Uh, Dr. Uh, Eijawa. Uh, I know you're still very much with us. Uh, most times when we talk about such visits, we look at the implication and the impact on our economy right here in Nigeria. Uh, let's take a, a, a second to take a look at what would, what would this mean for Nigerians in diaspora, Nigerians uh, in the Netherlands, for example. Uh, now, this visit by the president, what, what does it uh, you know, portend for them, uh, and the, the implication you know, for uh, Nigerians there? And also, could you also uh, tell us uh, how... Are we going to be able to measure the success of this visit, you know, in, in the long run? And then what are the implications uh, for Nigeria's international reputation and global influence? Thank you so much. Um, before I do that, I just want to quickly, um, in response to His Excellency, sir, the Ambassador, about domestic um, investments, it's not so much a, a question, as I, was, as I mentioned, wasn't so much a question of, do we prefer domestic investments over foreign direct investments? No. It's more of um, ensuring that we ensuring that we extol the two in such a way that we have maximum economic benefit, in such a way that um, the most people benefit from both foreign direct investment, like the drive that uh, the president is on a, a foreign direct investment drive. And uh, the maximum benefit from both that and domestic investment. Also, domestic investment is an indicator of how well the the the, the economy, the Nigerian macroeconomy is doing, the success and the extent to which domestic investment is thriving. And the state of the Nigerian economy right now in that regard, it's um you know we we have we have businesses, some especially small, medium enterprises closing down, even some large enterprises closing down. Another reason why we would prefer domestic investment to foreign investment is domestic investment employs more people, okay? Employs more people, although foreign investments would, um, would improve the quality of employment because it would probably be employing more skilled workers, but domestic investment employs more people. So in, uh, unemployment rates will be, you know, driven down to a relatively large extent. Both are, are very um, important. So as you said about the relation, Nigerians in diaspora, especially in the Netherlands, I think um, it's, for example, that business, Nigerian Dutch Business Investment Forum would create opportunities for businesses, Nigerian businesses, in Netherlands. So existing business in, in, in Netherlands as well as new businesses. I want to believe and I want to hope that there were some good representation of the private sector in that meeting from Nigeria and as well as from the Netherlands. So that will that engagement with businesses and investors in Netherlands, indigenous businesses and indigenous um, 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 invest stores in Netherlands alongside engaging Nigerian business and investors from Nigeria and also domiciled in in Netherlands will provide a forum for engagement that should give birth or that should yield more business, more investment for both countries. Also, um, on the diplomatic front, you know, it improves and it deepens the relationship um, between the two countries, the embassies, the Nigerian embassy in the Netherlands improves the relationship. It gives the Nigerians there a stronger sense of, um, when you build a people people diplomacy, and it gives them a stronger sense of being well represented. And then also you said, you talked about um, how long it will take for these engagements to materialize. I, I think that is not really very clear to tell the timeline it will take. So first of all, these are agreements. These are agreements. So both parties need to go back to the drawing room, right? Go back to their drawing room, especially the investors. They, like like Ambassador said, they need to come and engage um, not just their researchers, but research institutes in 
Nigeria. They need to come and engage and carry out to see the economy for themselves, to see really, truly how viable. So all of those will take some time for investors to make the actual move, for, to actually implement um, in the chosen sectors. For example, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Adesua there. I was, we sincerely uh, apologize for cutting you short uh, there because of our time. We have to uh, cut you short. Uh, but let's just take a parting word from the ambassador now in terms of implementation, which has always been the major you know, challenge that we have concerning all these visits. How best do you think you know, all these gains can be well implemented you know, so that we can actually derive the benefits in less than uh, 60 seconds, sir? Well, there should be immediately an interministerial meeting on the outcomes of Mr. President's visit to the Netherlands to examine the decisions taken between the two countries and translate them into action according to the mandates of the ministries. This is very critical. So I will advise the Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs to immediately call for an interministerial meeting particularly around agriculture, power, transportation, and so forth, in order to examine where the areas that could be leveraged based on the decisions that the Prime Minister of the Netherlands and the President of Nigeria have arrived at is very critical. And then for them now to submit an advisory note to Mr. President that this is the best way to go on the sectoral dissection of outcomes from your discussion with your Netherlands counterpart. Thank you so much, Ambassador Usman uh, Saraki, a former Nigerian Deputy Permanent Representative uh, to the United Nations. Many thanks Thank for your you. thoughts Thank you. and your time. You. We appreciate you. Of course, uh, Dr. Adoyi Matthew Mali, International Affairs Analyst, many thanks uh, for joining us for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And we also sincerely um, uh, uh, appreciate uh, Dr. Adesua. A. A. Diawa, uh, Senior Research Fellow, International Economic Relations Division of Nigeria Institute of International Affairs. Uh, many thanks for being a part of the conversation. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. This Tuesday, we're sure you enjoyed it. Remain to you to the NTA. I'm here Ray John. See you tomorrow. And I'm Adimola Adeoye. Thanks for joining us. Do have a pleasant day.